Double zero eight nine three five four two. Seven double zero eight nine three five four two. Or email us on sales at luke dash app dot tv. Subscribe, click the notification button. Join the Look Up TV movement now. 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 From the ticket to your next meal, to your ticket to the next holiday, it's an easy way to ask for a boost when you're low. and keeping track of everything on the go. The future of money is simple, and it's here. Download the new Mpesa app today. You're right on time for the bottom line KE right here on Look Up TV. Remember, we promised and we've definitely made it happen right here on the bottom line KE. Every week on Mondays at 9 p.m., we get to meet and to try and dissect some of the key political events that are taking place in the country. Remember, we had promised to talk to Dr. Miguna Miguna, and of course, he's here with us. We'll definitely be able to be touching on an array of issues from the war on corruption. We'll talk about the Jubilee government's track record. We'll also look at the 2022 general elections dynamics. Plus, of course, would he work with Raila Odinga? And what would that take if uh, the answer to that is yes? We'll be able to also uh, hear from his own mouth as far as uh, what he thinks about today's Nairobi post uh, uh, Mike Sonko. Of course, we'll also be looking at some of those who have eaten a block on his Twitter handle. Would he be extending some olive branch or sympathy to unblock you? We'll be able to hear more on this, plus, of course, dissecting on the economic models of the political uh, front runners in the 2022 political um, uh, game plan. We'll also be able to hear more on this uh, uh, and others. Of course, we want you to keep tweeting. All you need to do is add the hashtag the bottom line KE. We'll be able to track your tweets. That's what we are looking at uh, throughout this particular conversation. We understand that they've been coming in and, of course, it will be easier if you add the hashtag the bottom line KE, if you have a question for Dr. Biguna Biguna, if you want to contribute to what uh, will be said on this particular program, kindly go ahead and tweet us. And you can tweet me at I'm Eugene Andangwe or at Lookup TV. All right. So in just a bit, we'll be introducing our guest tonight on the program. Stay with us. intellectually and politically. He says he believes strongly in the culture and civilization and the pride of an African so much that he celebrates it every day even when he goes to bed. Now, he is not new to controversy. During the Kanu regime of the late President Moi, he was detained due to his political activism. When he was released, he reportedly fled to Tanzania on foot and later granted political asylum in Canada, where he eventually gained citizenship. He is a firebrand lawyer, politician, and author, the man with the same name twice. They call him Dr. Miguna Miguna, and he's our guest tonight on the bottom line, K.E. Remo, you can be part of this particular conversation. You can ask him your questions. The hashtag is the bottom line, 
KE. Like I said earlier on, we are live across our digital platforms on YouTube and on our Facebook pages. Kindly feel free to also leave a comment or a question right there. Uh, Dr. Miguna Miguna, you're looking amazing. This is what most of the Kenyans who have even seen that picture you posted before we went on air. They say the general is looking amazing. What's, what's the secret? What's going on? Someone is even saying maybe life is much better there. If you were here, maybe you'd be looking different, Dr. Was I supposed to look bad? <laughs> Kubali compliment. <laughs> uh, no, I was not supposed to look bad. Exile is not supposed to be, uh, um, was not supposed to kill me. Yeah. Even though that could have been the intention. Yeah. Uh, but I want to correct you. I did not tell you that where I eventually gained citizenship. Mm -hmm. I think that is the propaganda of the state. Yeah. And I don't want to start on a wrong footing. Yeah. I'm in exile, mm -hmm. period. Mm -hmm. So the yes. question, Dr. Ari, what, what probably would be able to understand, it's been uh, about three years, going to four years, since, um, uh, you know, uh, you were deported or le you were, uh, you know, forced out of the country into exile. Um, the question that many Kenyans have been asking themselves is, Miguna Miguna has been saying that he's coming back to the country, much uh, to the point that you did not kick yourself out of the country, you know, but this is what most people have been asking. When is the general coming back? When is he coming back? Maybe what we could start from there. So um, uh, thank you very much for inviting me to your studio. And I say good evening to all Kenyans mm -hmm. uh, and everyone who is watching. I'm not sure if you can hear me. I can hear you. Oh, okay. So number one, uh, some of these questions have been asked, but sometimes I wonder mm -hmm. whether they are asked with uh, uh, clarity and genuine interest to know, or they are done uh, with, in bad faith. Mm -hmm. Because number one, everybody knows that I was in Kenya on February the 2nd, 2018 when a group of heavily armed uh, security people came to my home in civilian clothing and used military detonators to get into the house. They basically exploded the detonators into the house. Mm -hmm. They didn't knock. They didn't say they were coming. They broke down the gate and they broke down the door. Mm -hmm. And then they went ahead to rummage the house and broke many other doors mm -hmm. and abducted me from my own house mm -hmm. and detained me for six days mm -hmm. in communicado. Mm -hmm. They didn't give me access to lawyers like they do to everybody. They didn't give me access to doctors. They didn't take me to court. And instead, they took my Kenyan passport away from me, mm -hmm. put me in a plane, and forced me out of the country mm -hmm. to Canada. When I returned in March uh, 2018, they refused to allow me entry into the country despite many court orders. They then assaulted me physically at the airport then detained me at the airport for three days, notwithstanding many court orders, including the conviction of Matiangi and his group mm. by Justice Odunga. They then assaulted me, sedated me, and forced me out of the country. So anyone asking why I've not come back to the country must have his head examined. Because I was in the country before I was forced out. I returned before I was taken out by force again. And then the third time, which was last year in January, they issued red alerts. And two airlines were not able to fly me into Kenya in January last year, notwithstanding Justice Corrid's order that I was allowed to enter Kenya and leave Kenya with my national ID card or the passport that they are destroyed. Mm -hmm. So that's why I'm not in Kenya. 
I, I thought the question should not be asked. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I believe it is unfair to ask me the question. The media in Kenya operates as if they have no memory. Mm -hmm. And if the people are asking that question because they are forgotten for whatever reason, it is the duty of the media to inform the public. But today, it is my duty, not just to inform you, mm -hmm. but to inform everyone and remind them of what happened. I am not in Kenya because despot Uru Kenyatta has decided to disobey court orders and violate my rights. I know many will ask, why do I call him despot? Mm -hmm. That's the English word for a man who does not respect the rule of law, for a man who sub, uh, sub, sub, subverts the constitution, for a man who defies court orders and does not care about human rights. That's a despot. Mm -hmm. Right. Dr. Ari, there are those who argue, and they would probably want to ask, when you say that anybody who's asking why you're not back in Kenya should have their heads examined, um, and they probably look up to you to give direction in that sense of, um, uh, this is what I'm doing or this is what my legal team is continuing to do to be able to ensure that I am back in the country. Um, would they be genuine when they say probably you have, uh, you know, put your hands up in submission and said, you know what, I cannot be able to beat this system and that's it. I'm not able to come back to Kenya because they kicked me out of the country and they've refused to obey the court orders. What if the status quo continues? What, what next for you? So, so it is like, uh, I'll give you an analogy, mm -hmm. and maybe you will be able to, un to, to appreciate why that question sounds ridiculous. Mm -hmm. So one day, Nelson Mandela in 1964, thereabout, Nelson Mandela was abducted also and put in and uh, charged and tried and convicted for terrorism and sentenced uh, to, to life imprisonment. Mm -hmm. And Nelson Mandela was in Robben Island. And there are a lot of South Africans that were born when Nelson Mandela was actually in jail. Uh, but they got to know why Nelson Mandela was in jail. He was trying to fight for the liberation of South Africans. But then if a media person asked, a media person, Mark you, mm -hmm. not a person who was just born yesterday, asked, mm -hmm. why can Nelson Mandela come out of the Robben Islands? You see how ridiculous that question is? Mm -hmm. Because Nelson Mandela has been locked in Robben Island by the apartheid system who have refused to release him. Mm -hmm. So somebody is asking, why can't he come out? Or alternatively, why did uh, Steve Biko decide to die? Do you understand? And we all know that he was murdered. Mm -hmm. Or why was Oliver Tambo in exile when Nelson Mandela was in jail? Mm -hmm. When we all know <laughs> that he was exiled and South African government refused to allow him back in. Mm -hmm. So that's why I'm saying uh, it, it, it is ridiculous. Someone who is an adult of sound mind would require their heads to be examined when they ask the question of a man whom you saw being forced out by armed men um, when he did not plan to travel out of Kenya. Yeah. I was sleeping in my house. And then when I tried to come back, like the court had ordered and I wanted to, they had more than 2,000 people armed to the teeth at the airport to prevent him from coming in. I mean, if Miguna had committed a crime, why not just take him to court? They refused to take me to court because they knew I had not committed any crime. Mm -hmm. It has nothing to do with surrender mm -hmm. unless the word surrender lost its meaning or has a different meaning. Surrender would mean that I say, like Rail Odinga did, I join you. You have won. Right? That's what Rail Odinga did mm -hmm. on March the 9th, 2018. He raised up both hands to Uru Kenyatta and said, just like you wish, I'll do like you wish. For what and he says, for like, what, for no, what no, he believes, for what he believes was for the sake of the let, peace let, of the country. Let me finish. Mm -hmm. 
Raila Odinga did exactly that. He surrendered mm -hmm. because Raila Odinga had said that his elections had been stolen. And I believed him. I still believe that. But the person who stole his election is the one he joined without any conditions. And then he disarmed his own people, his supporters, and said there was something great that was going to come out of this handshake. Nothing came out of it. There, there has been absolutely no gain to the Kenyan people. So that's what probably some people want me to do, and that's what I would never do. So on the contrary, I'm the one who has not surrendered. Mm -hmm. I have not in any way gone against my principles. I've continued to call Uhuru Kenyatta what he is, a tyrant. And I will continue fighting for my rights, no matter what Uhuru Kenyatta and his group does. So the physical denial of me from entering Kenya is resist, um, um, is, is, is a sign of weakness. The state fears me, because otherwise, why have they locked you out of Kenya? Why have they locked everybody else who is talking in Kenya? Right. They right. fear me. So you can't turn that into a weakness. Right. Dr. Miguna, what is this that probably you'd be able to tell uh, someone listening to you say that the state fears me, and probably they are not finding understanding of that statement? Why, why would the state fear you, Dr. Miguna Miguna? It's obvious. <laughs> it's obvious, Mr. Anangwe. I, I think everybody, as I say, everybody with common sense, um, everybody who has, um, who has sound mind mm -hmm. and who has memory will remember that before Uhuru Kenyatta abducted me and forced me out of Kenya, I was leading the national resistance movement. So I start there. What was it supposed to be resisting? It was supposed to resist electoral injustice and theft that he had perpetrated. Two, what is it had I planned and others in the national resistance movement? I had planned to pull down Uhuru Kenyatta's portraits from offices and burn them in bonfires as other um, symbols of resistance would go up. And I had planned a nationwide mobilization to be able to have Kenyans confront Uhuru Kenyatta's tyranny head on. Mm -hmm. If they didn't fear that, and it was all democratic, it was all legal, if they did not fear that, then why did they broke th break through my door? Why did they detain me in communicado? Right. Why did they take me to court? Why did they force me out of the country? Why did they destroy my passport? Why haven't they allowed me to come back home? Why have they disobeyed all the court orders? So, Mr. Nangwe, it is very clear. They did that because of fear. You would not exile someone you don't fear. Throughout history, the only people that have been exiled have been exiled because the state fears them. Uh, you know, from Lenin to, um, to Castro, to the revolutionary leaders of South Africa, to anyone that you can think of. History is replete with individuals with integrity, individuals with progressive ideas, individuals who are fearless and are confronting a dictatorship or a tyranny, and the tyranny or the tyrants decide the only way that we stay in power Mm. is to keep the opponent by force outside the country. And that's right. what they have done. Right. Uh, Raila Odinga, the ODM leader, is on the record, having said that um, why would Uhuru Kenyatta fear Miguna Miguna? Why would Raila Odinga even fear Miguna Miguna? 
in fact, in his own words, he, f he said that you're just like a barking dog that cannot bite. In fact, he says, come and back from here in the country. I mean... Yeah, but, but how do I come in if they have refused to allow me in? You see, that is silly. Mm -hmm. And Rai Ludinga knows that. Rai Ludinga himself has been to exile. <laughs> you know? So he's talking like he was not in exile himself in 1990s. And he came back home because he was allowed to come back home. The question you have to ask yourself is this. Why is he abusing me when I saw him in? You see how ungrateful he is. This is how Raila is ungrateful. Raila was ungrateful. Um, I can count so many people Raila has been ungrateful to. Mm -hmm. Raila has been ungrateful to Ratengo Ginko Gego, who pulled him out of the mark and helped him when he went and joined Kanu. Raila has been ungrateful to even William Ruto, who helped him in 2007. Uh, Raila has been ungrateful to everyone. He has called everyone names, people who have helped him. So I was his advisor, not his PA, his advisor. Mm -hmm. Then I am the one, the only one who swore him in when people like Orengo were shitting in their pants and couldn't do it. People like Otiende couldn't raise up to do it. And now I'm the one he's calling a dog. Imagine if he can do that to someone who sacrificed his life to swear him in. Something he wanted to do, but he had nobody courageous enough to do for him. And imagine my house was destroyed as a result partly because of that. And imagine I was forced out of Kenya because, largely because of that. Mm -hmm. And that's the person he's calling a dog. So can you imagine people who have not done anything for him? He does not have any respect for Kenyans. Raila Odinga only cares about himself and his greed for money and power. So I don't really care what he says. I think my record is very clear. Kenyans know that I am fearless and Raila is the opposite. Raila is a coward. That is why he's working with Uhuru Kenyatta, and I am not. So let me put it the other way. Mm -hmm. I hold no public office in Kenya. That's well known, right? Correct. I am not a billionaire and I've not looted anything in Kenya, and I don't have uh, hundreds of thousands of acres in Kenya, correct? But Uhuru Kenyatta has hundreds of thousands, if not millions of acres, is a trillionaire, if not a, a multi-billionaire, and has all the power. So which means that if I wanted money, the easiest thing to do is to surrender and get money from Uhuru Kenyatta, like Raila did. But yet I don't. If I was a coward like Raila, I would have surrendered to Uhuru because he has power. I have not. So don't you see the stark difference between us? One person has principles and says, I am not going to surrender to injustice and I'm not going to surrender to, um, to tyranny and I'm not going to surrender to barbarism. And the other does exactly that. Right. So this is not a man that should even, he's not fit to tie my shoelaces. He's not fit, he's not qualified. Right. The only reason people talk about Rai Lodinga is because he's the son of Jaramogi and because the media have made him to be who he is not. You see, you can make a fool look like uh, a genius just by talking about him as if he was, when everybody else knows that he's a fool. Dr. Miguna, there are those who will argue and they'll say, based on what you just said, we've been reading uh, from some of the analysis, um, uh, especially just anchoring on that point of fear, um, uh, that they fear you. You did take a stab at active politics in 2007. You contested for the Nyando constituency parliamentary seat, but you actually failed to make it beyond the ODM primaries. And part of the reason why uh, probably the 
Odinga camp and those who are his supporters are saying that why would Raila fear you when even in the political arena uh, you did not even make it past the ODM primaries. Uh, what do you tell such people who probably undermine you from that perspective? That you cannot there tell us nobody, anything. You're not a political there, heavyweight. Other than the media, there is nobody doing it from that perspective. Everybody yeah. knows yeah. that I cannot be mentioned in that line. Mm -hmm. You know very well that Miguna is not the equivalent of, of your clueless MP. You know that. I mean, I, I don't think I should be able to argue that point. That point is pretty much clear. All right? Mm -hmm. Because if I wasn't, why was, did he appoint me his advisor? Do you understand? Mm -hmm. The senior most advisor. I, I've seen people, including even Mr. Abdikadir the other day, comparing me to saying that when they went to Naivasha, Miguna was locked out of the Naivasha negotiation room with, uh, with Moses Kuria. Yeah. You see, they are very, very desperate to try to <laughs> reduce my stature because everybody knows my counterpart during the Grand Coalition was Professor Kevuta Kibwana, not Moses Kuria. So if you're going to mention that Miguna, something happened to me in Naivasha, uh, together with my counterpart, then you put Kevuta Kebwana, not Moses Kuria. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. But but they are so desperate, they wouldn't want to do that. Because they know the obvious, right? Mm -hmm. Like, so, uh, there is nothing to say there. Uh, if I'm so useless, and um, I, 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 I don't have any stature, allow me back home. Let's see. Let the country decide. Why don't they allow that? They haven't allowed that. Mm -hmm. Let Kenyans be the ones making that decision. And by the way, when Castro took power in, uh, in, in Cuba in 1959, he had never held public office. All right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> when Lenin took power in Russia, he had not held public office. You don't have to hold public office to be anything. When Sankara became president of Burkina Faso and transformed it, he, 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 was, he was nothing, really. He was not even a, a major general. He was a captain. Very low in the army, right? Mm -hmm. so, so people who worship positions, positions that are not even, they are not entitled to, or positions that uh, they are not qualified to hold, are the ones who will be mesmerized by MP. I don't know. You are called Prime Minister. It's useless in a banana republic. Yeah. I don't care how many titles they have. Right. They they don't merit those titles. They are not leaders. They have no vision. They have no transformative ideology. They have no ideas. So they think. What make them something is the amount of money they have stolen mm -hmm. or the amount of land they have accumulated or the amount of power they have. And I don't respect that. I don't respect power. I don't respect position. I don't respect money. I respect ideas. That's what I respect. I respect vision. I respect virtue. I respect integrity. I respect transformation. I respect justice. Those are the values I respect. Fair enough. I, I wanted to just quickly ask you this particular question because you've mentioned um, uh, Raila Odinga in various lights. And in, um, in, in, in 2012, you did pen your thoughts through the book, Peeling Back the Mask, A Quest for Justice in Kenya. This particular book... Uh, literally depicted uh, Raila Odinga as a chatterland and a man not to be trusted, and it was published in 2012. You went ahead to publish uh, another uh, one. Have you read it? Have you read it? Just, just first no, no, of all, no, no. have you read the listen book? To my have question you read first. the book? Uh, listen to my question first. No, uh, no, no. Have you read the book? I need to know whether you have read the book because I'm, I'm not going to discuss something that you have not read. Have you right. read the book? You see, the question, the question is anchored on the aspect of what. You say, Eugene, what have is, you read the book? Okay, Dr. Ari, I have not have had a chance it? to read the whole book. But well, then don't ask a question <laughs> about a book you have not read. No, but...
me out. He hear me off, out, Dr. Hear me off out. A, hear the, no, this is the question. No, you started off on a false premise. This is the question. You started by, you penned your thought. Kindly listen to my question. All right? No, no, the so, question is premised on a false premise. No, but, but, the, but peeling back the mask, what was it about? Then tell us. What it's, was a it about? it's a memoir. It's a memoir. Go read it first before you ask questions about it. So it's a memoir. I'm not going to entertain questions <laughs> from people who have not read the book. Read the, the book. Then we will have a knowledgeable discussion. All right. But if you don't read the book, it, and now you are coming with questions people have given you, this, then we no one has discuss, given me any because question. they will have to... No, let me finish. They will have to tell you yeah. what next to ask. <laughs> I'm not going to... Uh, I'm not going to answer questions from somebody who has not read my book. Dr. Is right? the issue I've not yeah. read the book or is the question? Is it the question no. I'm about to ask? The or is question this because is supposed not read to the be book? premised on a book you have not read. So my, my suggestion to you is this. Uh -huh. As a journalist, yes. read the book uh -huh. and then I then come back and ask, ask you the questions. question. All right, fair enough. So would you work with Raila Odinga in any No, point? I wouldn't. You wouldn't? No, I wouldn't. Mm -hmm. Why would I work with a charlatan? You yourself said I said he's a charlatan, right? In 2012, 2013, but still went ahead to work with him in NASA. I did not work with Rail Odinga. You see, this is the problem. Mm -hmm. And I told you when mm -hmm. we were discussing this interview yes. that Mr. Nangwe, <laughs> don't fall into the trap of the average Kenyan so-called reporter mm -hmm. who comes with questions people have written for him who has not necessarily digested the question and understands its import, mm -hmm. and then come to me, mm -hmm. because you will not get through. I will answer you, mm -hmm. but you will not get through that shallow kind of question. Mm -hmm. Number one, everybody knows, and I've said it repeatedly, yeah. that I did not work with Raila Odinga after his electoral uh, victory was stolen in 2017. But I have said that who him in. Let me answer the question. Yeah. So number one, I did not work with him. I did not work for him. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. What I did is join the struggle for electoral justice. Rail Odinga happened to have been the person whose victory had been stolen. It could have been anybody. Mm -hmm. It could have been you. It could have been Ruto. It could have been Mosalia. It could have been Joe Blow. I really don't care. Mm -hmm. The fact is, a choreographed exercise had been uh, held or conducted in Kenya that did not meet constitutional remits. Mm -hmm. The Supreme Court said as much. I analyzed the situation and realized that Uhuru Kenyatta had stolen the election. I decided as Miguna and others that we were not going to accept that mm -hmm. and that we were going to do everything possible to make sure that the thief, the electoral thief, was brought to account. That's what I was doing. Mm -hmm. It happened that Raila was aggrieved. And so Raila, together with others and myself, were confronting electoral injustice. That's not joining Raila in anything. Why is it that Raila is the default? We are all Kenyans. I'm a Kenyan, just like he is. Mm -hmm. I have rights, just like he has. And if we are fighting against something, it does not have to be on behalf of Raila. You Democracy does not belong him as a to Raila Dinga. You had already Just described him. Does not belong to Raila Odinga. You had already, okay? you had already described him as a char 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 charlatan in 2012. You went ahead and still uh, wrote another one, which I have not yet read, uh, Daktari, uh, and and I agree with you. So don't yes. ask questions I'll about something to, you have to not read. It, but I'm going by what is in the public domain um, uh, 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 in this particular sense, in terms of description of these memoirs um, uh, of yours. But you still went ahead to work with him. As a matter of principle, what I'm asking is. They say that in this uh, game there are no permanent enemies. If no, you yes. see, you see, Mr. Nangwe. Now yes. I don't uh, distinguish you with the rest. <laughs> now I think you're just like the others because uh -huh. number one, uh -huh. you've had a lot of time uh -huh. 
to read the books you want to ask questions on. Mm -hmm. And you decided not to read them. They're not very long books. If you wanted to read them overnight, you would have done so, so that we could have had an intelligent discussion. Mm -hmm. But you refuse to do so. Number two, you are repeating what people are saying, pedestrians on the street. So there is no distinction between a journalist and a pedestrian on the street. You see, I have made this point clear, and I don't know why you're not getting it. Mm -hmm. I fight for justice. And in 2017, 2018, that's what I was fighting for, not for Railodinga. Mm -hmm. It happened to be that Railodinga had had his election stolen. So he was the victim. So therefore, people who are shallow would see that I am doing it for him. No, I'm not doing it for him. Mm -hmm. I'm doing it for the country. Electoral justice belongs to citizens of Kenya, not to Railodinga. Okay? Mm -hmm. And even if Railodinga is the perpetrator or the victim, the fact of the matter is that when you are resisting electoral injustice, you are resisting against the person who has perpetrated it, who was Uhuru Kenyatta. Railodinga is a Kenya, just like you. Mm. And at one time, he was supposed to be doing exactly that, resisting electoral injustice. Mm -hmm. But then in between, he surrendered and he joined the electoral thief. Would you be happy that I would be so unprincipled that I decide to follow him in his surrender and leave the course that I was fighting? Right. The, what kind the of point logic is, home, is that? The point is clear. You've said... Uh, that that instead of saying, Miguna, you have demonstrated principle, mm -hmm. that you have not bent your principle, that you have stayed on course, you are now blaming me for not following Raela to, to, to Abucha. You, you know, this is serious. Mm -hmm. It's like saying, I mean, brutalized everybody in Uganda... So the people who joined him are good. The people who fought him are bad. I mean, what kind of logic is that? This kind of contorted logic can only be found in Kenya, particularly among the so-called journalists. Mm -hmm. And it is disappointing because you should know better. Right, Dr. Tari, fair enough. That's why we're having this conversation, you know. Um, uh, now, let, let's move the conversation forward. But you changed the conversation. No, no, no. We were that, supposed to talk about Kenya. Yes, this now is where we're are, heading now. No, this, no, this, no, because this is a trick always with the Kenyan media. We are in 2021, okay? We have struggles of today. I am a victim of human rights violations. Mm -hmm. But instead of talking about these issues, Instead of talking about the people who are violating the rights of Kenyans, Kenyans who are continuing to suffer even now. You want to take us to a book you have not read? You want to take us to 2007 when Miguna is supposed to have uh, run for elections in ODM? You want to take us to another book in 2012 you have not read? What kind of rubbish is this? Dr. every book has a preamble. There is always a, a, a set of layout. I would like you to kindly allow me to lay out the conversation as you agreed to have this conversation. It but is you're okay. Not you can it be able in a to. a coherent, logical yes. way. That is why I'm here. Correct. If Correct. you wanted to invite somebody, <laughs> if you wanted to invite the normal Kenyan yeah. who would be smiling and laughing and happy just yeah. because they have been given a chance to speak, yeah. this is not one of them. And right. you know that. So let's move the conversation forward, if you can. Um, so what would you be then um, uh, looking at in terms of a country whereby we have seen several court orders um, uh, defied by the president, several of them. I, I think there have been so many that, um, uh, you know, some of the Kenyans have even lost count of them. But yet the government of the day continues to serve. We, we, we have seen... Um, uh, the president is about even to finish his term. And there are those who have been arguing that the clarion call that you've been making, despots must fall, Uhuru must fall. And here he is. He's about to finish his term. And some of them have been saying that these calls are falling on deaf ears. I mean, what, what would you say about that? So, Mr. Nangwe, I, I, I want to uh, respond by educating Kenyans, including yourself, mm -hmm. uh, because history is very important. 
How long did it take Kenyans to fight the British colonialist before we eventually got the flag independence? It was not four years. Mm -hmm. Yes, they have locked me out of Kenya for four years. How long did they lock even Jomo Kenyatta, however bad he was, in Lodwa? Right? Yes. Did it stop anything? Did it stop the liberation struggle? It didn't. How long did apartheid in South Africa last? More than 100 years, isn't it? Correct. It eventually fell. How long was Hitler in power in Germany? It wasn't two years. The fact that a regime, a tyrannical regime, the fact that a dictator has been in power even for 10 years doesn't make any difference to me. Because eventually the dictatorship will fall. You see, this is the difference between people who know history and who understand ideology mm -hmm. and who understand struggle like I do from the rest who think that you say there shall be rain and the rain comes down. Mm -hmm. A struggle is not a, a, a Christmas party. All right? A liberation struggle is not a choir. So, Yes, I have been saying despots must fall, and I will continue to do so until they do. This struggle is not for me only. This struggle does not belong to me. This struggle belongs to humanity. It belongs to Kenyans. And it doesn't matter if I say despots must fall, and I continue to struggle, and they do not fall in my lifetime. Because I know eventually they will, as long as we continue the struggle. You don't stop agitating for justice because there is so much injustice around you. Yeah. If you did that as a principle, as a mode of operation, then nothing will change. For instance, what do you tell the homeless in Kenya? You tell them to give up? because there is so much injustice and there is so much homelessness, they should give up, they should no longer struggle to be able to find homes, or they're unemployed. A lot of them have graduated, some of them with distinction from the university, first class degrees, with very good degrees really, from electrical engineering, from medicine, from actuarial sciences, to Bachelor of Arts and other things, right? Right. They are all unemployed in their millions. Are we going to tell them to give up? No, we can't. We can't tell them to give up. We must tell them to continue fighting because their cause is just. That liberation is a good thing. Equality is a good thing. Mm -hmm. That transformation of society so that everybody else benefits from the wealth of the country is a good thing. And that the domination of power by a few entitled individuals, the few who have looted everything and continue to do so, is a bad thing that we must end. And in our little way, you may be doing it through tweets, you may be doing it on Facebook, you may be doing it by joining a, a popular movement, you may be doing it by joining a, a union, you may be doing it by joining a picket, whatever you do, if we do it consciously, if we do it together, if we do it in a disciplined way, we will end tyranny and exploitation and inequality sooner than we think. Right. That is how apartheid ended in South Africa. That's how all unequal and oppressive systems ended. That's right. my message. Right. Um, Doctor, we are staring at an election in 2022. And of course, the war on corruption has always been mentioned as something that must be at the top of the agenda. For you, even yourself, you 
you had this at, at, at deep in your heart when you wanted to vie for, uh, when you vied actually for the governor uh, position in Nairobi. Now, President Uru Kenyatta, um, in mid-January this year, uh, did actually outrightly put out a figure of how much the country is losing through corruption every day. He mentioned 2 billion Kenya shillings. Analysts insist that this number could even be more. As we stare to the election in 2022, are you concerned that the same figures, the same characters, could end up still uh, uh, you know, becoming top leaders in this country uh, that have not been able to fight corruption in the way it should be? Well, that's a good question. Uh, the focus really should not be on the election mm -hmm. and should not be on members of parliament or all these other people. These are distractions. The problem is Uru Kenyatta. So let's start there. Mm -hmm. um, and to tell you the truth, the theft is the lesser evil. The main evil and the main crime Uru Kenyatta has committed is to subvert the constitution of Kenya, including the Bill of Rights. Kenyans are killed every single day by the police, extrajudicially, more than in any other African country except in a war zone. Mm -hmm. So it's almost like Kenyans are in a war zone without war having been declared. And the war is against the ordinary Kenyans. For example, right now, we don't know how many people these people are killing in Laikipia because they don't publish the figures and the media would not do it. In more responsive countries, they would. So that's number one. Uhuru Kenyatta is public enemy number one. Now, when it comes to corruption, is the culprit number one. Because before we get to his figures, which I, I agree, are uh, deflated. How much did he steal through the SGR? More than 400 billion. None other than Jimmy Wanjigi, who is one of the biggest crooks in Kenya, confessed to that. Do you understand? 400 billion. Who did he give the contract to? His brother Muhoho Kenyatta. That's the one he gave the SGR contract to. So that's where the money went. How about the COVID billionaires? Who are they? All his relatives, from his sisters, to his children, to his brother, to many of his family members. Has any of them been charged and tried and convicted? No. In fact, his buddy, his drinking and smoking buddy, David Murade, was even summoned to the, uh, uh, by the ESCC and I believe uh, was supposed to have been summoned by the DCI. Has he been charged? Uru Kenyatta said these people would be charged in 21 days. It's more than a year and nobody has been charged. And the other day, uh, his cabinet minister, uh, son, was caught at the airport with more than 4 million US uh, dollars in cash. He refuted Has he this. been charged? He refuted Pardon this. me? Uh, you expect him to confess? Have they ever confessed, any of them? <laughs> the other day, his former minister of, of, of sports, Wario, was convicted. How did he get off? Somebody steals over 20 million Kenya shillings, but g gets fined 3.6 million. Forget about the interest, forget about the principle, forget about the fact that this was public funds. Mm -hmm. It should have gone to jail, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. so, so what I'm saying, and how about Anwaiguru? You expected her to confess, yet we know how much was lost in the NYS scandal. How about Ngilu that he fired from the cabinet for theft of public resources? Right now, they are together in the same camp trying to pretend that they are campaigning for Railodinga because they want unity of Kenya. So Ngilu, whom he fired, saying Ngilu was corrupt, is now supposed to be clean, right? And so many others, do you understand? So the person who is looting public resources and really the person who should be answerable 
for the theft of public resources, number one, is Uhuru Kenyatta. Number two, are all these ministers, including cabinet secretaries, including people like Fred Matiangi, who are convicted? Um, Justice Odunga, on March 29th, 2018, convicted Matiangi for contempt of court and fined him 200,000 Kenya shillings. He has not paid the fine and is a convicted criminal, but right. he's still serving in a very powerful position. When you're surrounded by crooks, and these are supposed to be your best friends, you can't claim to be clean. Right. Uhuru Kenyatta is not clean. So what are we going to do about it? I start with you. What are you doing about it as a journalist? Because in many countries, it is journalists who bring these people down. So if you're not doing something about it, I turn the question upside down to you. What are you doing about it? Fair what question. you should be doing about it is exactly what I'm doing. Exposing it, mm -hmm. constantly talking about it, mobilizing Kenyans to oppose it, and eventually it will be brought to account like Zuma was. I want to read your thoughts, Dr. Miguna, on this whole scenario where you know, there's always been a, 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 a cry from politicians every time, um, you know, there is a case against them. And Deputy President William Ruto himself, in fact, has warned. He, he, he said um, uh, that um, uh, uh, the narrative that the journalists have been creating is that of uh, that he is corrupt and we are trying to push them that is the top leadership of the government, to rush into making decisions uh, that when they go to the courts of law, half or most of those who have been uh, judged by the court of public opinion as corrupt do not end up being judged or found guilty by the courts. In fact, the deputy president says the war on corruption is a war about integrity and an integrity war that does not have integrity ceases to be an integrity war and actually becomes corruption in itself. When these leaders say these things, um, do you see any logic, any genuineness? Who's fooling who? Who's the weakest link in this war against corruption? I think I've been very clear. First of all, if what you are saying is what uh, Ruto said, of course he's wrong. Uh, the war of corruption should be a war on all the corrupt, including himself. I mean, everybody knows he's corrupt. So, so it's inexcusable for anybody to say that the war of, or in, or, or on corruption is supposed to be any other thing other than the war on the corrupt like himself. Mm. Railodinga is corrupt, Ruto is corrupt, Mudavadi is corrupt, Kalonzo is corrupt, Wetangula is more than corrupt, Gilu is corrupt. The whole lot of them are corrupt through and through. We all know. And we all have evidence of everything that they have stolen. Okay? Mm -hmm. This is not something we are just talking about. This is something that we have evidence, credible evidence on. And if we were serious about the war on corruption, the whole lot of them should be in jail for 50 years each without remission, without parole. You lock them up and you throw away the keys. Okay? Mm -hmm. That would be justice. It would be summary. It would be swift and it would be unremitting. That's what I would do. Because the evidence is all over the place. But you can see who was the former director of public prosecutions. Do you remember? Kereyako mm -hmm. Tobiko. Yes. Who appointed Kereyako Tobiko minister? Uhuru Kenyatta. So therefore, when he was there, he was working for Uhuru Kenyatta. Who is the biggest land thief in the Republic of Kenya? The Kenyatta family, the biggest land thief, followed by the Moi family, and followed by all the others. So if you have the director of public prosecution being rewarded to be a cabinet minister immediately after his term ends, you know, that is not even ethical. Because in many countries, that would not be ethical. But you can tell that no wonder most of these crooks were not charged, were not tried, were not convicted, and were not sentenced. Where is Kideru? 
still enjoying his stolen billions, right? Where is Wainaina that helped him still? Still enjoying his billions. Where are all those people who worked with Nairobi uh, County government that were caught red-handed stealing, still enjoying their billions? How about Ajamong, still enjoying his billions? How about all these governors, including Awiti of Oma Bay, who is so filthy that skunk would smell sweeter, still enjoying their billions? So the point is, my friend, I blame the media. All right? I do. Mm -hmm. Seriously. Because that's the media's job. I know a few media personalities have tried, like Okari and the rest, mm -hmm. uh, you know, to do the right thing. But you see, this has to be concerted. This yeah. has to be something that is done institutionally. Then I blame the lawyers and the accountants and the architects and the engineers before I blame the ordinary Kenyan. Mm -hmm. Because really, there should be a difference between people who have gone to school and people with degrees and people with professions and people with comfortable livelihoods vis-a-vis -vis the Lampen proletariat in Kibera who lives from hand to mouth and who does not have any stake in the system and can be killed today without anybody raising a voice. There should be a difference between what you are able to do against what is happening around you and what the person on the street can do. The moment we do it, the other people will have courage, the ones without the stake in this system. And the system will come tumbling down. Right. That is why in every society, the so-called middle class is very central. Mm -hmm. If it is crooked, it is rotten, it takes a while before the system comes crumbling down because the so-called middle class protects them because most of them acquired wealth not through work, not through creativity, not through innovation, not through resourcefulness, their own resourcefulness. They also just skimmed through the system, through corruption, they got what they have. Right. And that is a major problem. That's a major problem, Dr. Miguna, you say. And, and, and so, as you just described everybody else that you just mentioned by name, um, Dr. Miguna, these are the same people uh, who are running for office come 2022. Um, and, and, and today what we are seeing is a lot of what most analysts would say sloganeering. Um, and, and, and fighting corruption is not among the key things. We are hearing about the bottom-up economy, we are hearing about the Build Kenya, we are hearing about the 24 economy. Everybody is talking about lowering taxes and all that. Uh, what, what is the missing link here? What would you even say about these models as opposed to the real fight against corruption? First of all, they are not everybody. I mm -hmm. don't know why 15 people or 5 people become everybody. Mm -hmm. Kenya is a country of 40, 15 million, million. people. Yes. So when I talk of five people and you call them everybody, do you see the problem? You see, the problem is always in the question. Mm -hmm. When we reduce ourselves to be nobodies, because when you say those people are everybody and you are somebody, you are actually dehumanizing yourself. They are not everybody. They are such a tiny minority. And as I say, they are very dis uh, unqualified for whatever... I'll give you an example. Uru Kenyatta never worked a day in his life before he became president. Mm -hmm. Not a day in his life. Never. Before, when Moi picked him up from his drinking dance and made him a nominated member of parliament and appointed him into cabinet, he had never held a job. Mm -hmm. He had never run a business. He had never qualified from any educational institution of higher learning. He didn't have a diploma and didn't have a degree. But so if you have that, this is now the one to lead you to prosperity. Do you see the problem? Yeah. You will never prosper because you are being led by the most unqualified. It's like you have cancer and you're being treated by a plumber. You will never get well. Or you have any kind of condition and you go to a farmer to do surgery on your tummy, you will die. That is where Kenya is. Kenya has chosen 
the five most unqualified charlatans, and they call them the leading lights. A country that places charlatans cannot develop, my friend, will never transform and will never be democratic. So Kenyans must stop calling Raila Odinga, Uhuru Kenyatta, and this group of failures as leaders. They are not. They never were. They will never be. So, but you see, among the 50 million Kenyans, there are a lot of brilliant Kenyans. There are a lot of Kenyans with integrity. There are a lot of hardworking Kenyans. There are a lot of brilliant Kenyans with ideas who, if you give them a chance, they will transform Kenya in two years. So why isn't the media promoting them? You see, when you invite Miguna to this studio, you start by distracting and asking him very relevant things first to destabilize him. But if you call Rai Lodinga, you will be so enamored. You will be asking questions that he wants you to ask. Do you understand? That's the difference. Because it's almost like it got into every, the, the journalist's blood to praise the most unqualified. And I'm saying the moment we stop that, Kenya will transform. So that's the problem. The problem for me is not these charlatans because they know they're not qualified and the only way to continue perpetuating impunity is for them to buy a few people in the media so that they continue praising them. And I'll give you a good example mm -hmm. and then I'll end. Mm -hmm. In 2017, I ran for office in Nairobi. I hope that you are in Nairobi at that time. I had a manifesto, and I held it and explained what else Nairobi and how to actually solve the problem. Do you know that on a daily basis, the, need, the media were praising uh, Songo every day? It, the standard had a 15-page spread on Sonko, calling him all manner of good names. They were praising Kidero like crazy. When we went for debates, they would not want to give me a chance mm -hmm. to deconstruct them. Mm -hmm. Now, fast forward three, five years later, yeah. where is Sonko? And yet, now they are claiming it was not them. Yeah. It was the media that built Sonko, plus Uru Kenyatta that imposed him in Jubilee and William Ruto. These are the people. It was Raila Odinga who imposed Kidero and gave him a direct ticket in Nairobi. Did Raila Odinga not know that uh, Kidero was a thief? He knew. But as long as Kidero was bribing him and giving him money, Kidero was supposed to be a good man. Did they not have candidates, qualified Kenyans, that they could put forward to transform Nairobi? Mm -hmm. So now... They have a military man, another very thoroughly unqualified man, and a man occupying office illegally. And now they put him there because the idea is make Kenyans know that education means nothing. Make Kenyans accept that a transformative idea means nothing. Make Kenyans think that ideas are valueless mm -hmm. and that the only things that matter is a gun, and a ton of money. That's really what they want to do. The reason why Badi is occupying public office in Nairobi is precisely that. So that Kenyans become so cynical and forget about what their duty is and accept whatever it is that they have been given. And I'm challenging you and I'm challenging every Kenyan to reject this completely. Right. Uh, Dr. Miguna, I want us to move closer towards the end of the conversation, but I would love to hear your thoughts. Many Kenyans are, uh, in fact, uh, some had even asked me to ask you this. Um, looking at, uh, of course, you've already mentioned a few of the candidates in terms of how you feel and what you believe um, uh, they don't bring on the table and how they are not qualified uh, to, to, to run for office. But it would be interesting to hear your take as a person who's also been a contender in election, um, uh, active elections yourself, 
these economic models that are being uh, thrown into the throats of Kenyans, um, uh, what do you make of them? Let, let, let's, let's, uh, with your permission, <laughs> let's talk about them. I mean, that, the that's another good question. Approach. That's a good one. Yeah. You see, I, I acknowledge when a question is good, right? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, so that one is a good one. Yeah. So my answer is this: there is no economic model that has been brought forward by anyone. Of, Bottom of up the approach, channel. twenty-four hours economy. Yeah, none. None of them is, is economic. Mm -hmm. None of it is economic. None of them has brought an economic model. You see, the problem with Kenya yeah. is that even people who should understand what an economic model is have joined them. People like Ndi and the rest, they do understand. They know all this is abracadabra. You, you see, they are engaged in, in, in make-believe kind of thing. Mm -hmm. You see, and I've heard the media and other people talk about ideology as if ideology is anything that comes through anybody's mouth. Mm -hmm. You know, scientifically, there are very few ideologies in the world, you know. Capitalism is an ideology, okay? Yes. Communism is an ideology. Marxism-Leninism is an ideology, okay? Socialism is an ideology. Liberalism is an ideology. All these others are abracadabra. You see, these people must posit and position themselves on scientific ideologies and then present an economic model that is based on that ideology. An economic model cannot be based on nothing. It has to be based on an ideology. And there is no ideology called bottom-up. There is no ideology uh, that Rail Odinga is talking about, which is abracadabra. There is none. He is not identifying what it is. He says he's a social democrat, which could be a, 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 a branch of ideology. But then what he presents as an economic model is not a social democratic economic model. Because if you are a social democrat, you should come up with a social democratic, economic, social, cultural, and other programs that cohere with that ideology. If you are a conservative, you are a capitalist like Ruto, and Odinga is also a capitalist, then you should come up with capitalistic ideas and, and capitalistic economic models. And, and this thing called bottom-up cannot be found in any book of ideology. Do you understand? Right. So as long as Kenyans are talking about rubbish and then propelling rubbish into the position of ideology, you can't debate them if you're a serious man. But Dr. Mimina, and I consider we, myself a serious man. We've seen how yeah, they've right. pulled rallies. We've seen how they've uh, actually mesmerized people with all these um, uh, ideologies which they say, you see, these are our numbers. No, they are not they ideologies. The but I have to say, out yeah. of all those, the yeah. only person who seems to resonate with what the country, or the majority of Kenyans seem to want to hear yeah. is Ruto because he is a marketer. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. He's a marketer. So he's marketing something. Uh, he's the only one who has come close to doing something. It's not ideological, but it's some kind of marketing tool that he's using. So it's a nice marketing tool. That's what it is. Mm -hmm. The bottom up. It sounds chic. It sounds fresh. Mm -hmm. And it tends to, to, to resonate with the ones who have given up. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, if he takes power, all right, and I say if, I don't say when, I say if. Mm -hmm. If he takes power, it will be back to nothing. The same with Raila, back to nothing. Just meandering around, making the same mistakes we've seen. And if you ask him, didn't you say this? He will say, I did not say that was an ideology. And he will be right, mm -hmm. because it is not an ideology. Right. So what you're trying to say, or what you're saying, uh, Dr. Miguna, is that all these politicians, what they're doing is just trying to resonate with what the people want to hear, but not basically what is right for the country. Is this what you're trying to say? I did not say all of them. I mentioned specific ones. Yeah. You know, there are a lot of politicians in Kenya, right? Mm -hmm. The main ones that the media focuses on are talking complete, patented rubbish. 
-hmm. Ruben yeah. Kigame is not really well um, articulated so much uh, on the media. Uh, we, we, we don't hear a lot of people talk about him in the media. Uh, uh, so you said some of them, and those who are not really put or uh, a spotlight on um, uh, are the ones who probably could be able to be speaking what the country really needs. What would you say about him? So, so let me tell you, um, uh, no, I don't want to talk about people I don't know. So, so I don't know this man. Uh, and really, it would not be fair for me to talk about it. Right. The other fair people enough. I know. Fair enough. The other people I know very well, and I want to talk about. I've not had him either uh, identify what his ideology is, mm -hmm. to tell you the truth. Mm -hmm. But you see, the problem you're falling into mm -hmm. is to think that the only people who are doing politics are the ones who are running for elections, mm -hmm. or the ones who have declared that they're running for president. Right. There are a lot of Kenyans who are very political and are very clear and, and, and have very clear ideologies. Uh, but they have not necessarily said they are running. Then there are people who the media are not yet recognizing or have not recognized, or those who believe in a revolution, but, but you dismiss it mm -hmm. because you think it is not possible, mm -hmm. particularly in Kenya. And you think Kenya is some kind of island maybe in some outer space where human beings do not um, do not resemble others in Africa. Yet we know that we had a revolution in Sudan just a year ago. And there, it was supposed to be remoter than in Kenya because, because Al-Bashir was stronger than Uhuru as a strong man and he's a military man, right? Mm -hmm. And was as brutal, if not more brutal, than Uhuru Kenyatta. So people did not think that a revolution in Sudan was possible, but it did happen. How about Burkina Faso? Kompore had been in power for 30 years. Uhuru has hardly been in power for 10 years, yet he thinks he's as, as strong as an oak tree. Yet he is as, 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 he's useless, like four. The only reason Uhuru is in power is because Migura is in exile and, and is disorganized a, a few people who are with me together with Ray Lodinga. But it is coming. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. So what I champion for is a revolution, which really is an overhaul of the society, a transformation of the society from the bottom completely. Okay, you uproot the system that you have now and you create a people-friendly system a system based on merit. Nobody should be able to earn a living without earning it unless they're uh, disabled. Mm -hmm. All right? Unless they're not able to work. A lot of Kenyans with billions steal their billions from the suffering Kenyans. Right. Kenya is the only country that I know of where unemployment is so high and nobody's talking about it. Then somebody goes to uh, the UK, then says that he has become some kind of employment relations officer and that he has uh, secured some employment for nurses and he wants a cut. You know the Kenya government is getting a cut from the so-called nurses that are being sent to the UK? Sure. It's ridiculous. But nobody's talking about it. How do you export nurses to a developed country when the majority of Kenyans cannot access a hospital, do not have access to medicine? How do you do that? Do you understand? <laughs> like Kenyans, what is the ratio between uh, 1,000 Kenyans to a doctor? Mm -hmm. Is it even 1,000? What is the ratio in Britain? What is the ratio of the British vis-a-vis -a, -vis a nurse? So we need nurses more than Britain does, but we take our nurses to Britain nonetheless. Yet Kenya is more resource rich than the UK. Yeah, the argument because we, is, 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 we, our, we, we are creating our resources. Yes. My yeah. point, my point, yeah. uh, Eugene, yeah. is this. Yeah. I want Kenyans to become very angry with the way that the country has been raped 
for more than 60 years now by five families. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. And they want to choreograph something called an election, which is not going to be an election. And they are telling you openly that they want to rig it, that it will not be free and fair and credible. And they want to impose a senile man called Raila because they know he has become so useless anybody can control him so that they can perpetuate this uh, inequality and repression forever. Yeah. Kenyans must reject that. Yeah, Dr. Miguna, but the argument with the Raila supporters are feeling that today Raila stands even a higher chance because he is now able to even woo votes uh, in Central where he was not able to even step foot into. I mean, I mean, uh, how do you convince a Raila diehard that he, he can't, it can't happen? I think that person is living in, in um, I don't know whether it is hell or it is uh, some kind of dreamland. So let me remind them that in 1963, Jomo Kenyatta would not get, could not get even 2,000 votes anywhere in Kenya. And he was just made prime minister by uh, Raila's father and Tom Boyer. All right? Mm -hmm. And Tom Boyer could campaign anywhere in Kenya and had more support than anyone else at that time in terms of, you know, people responding to messages, including Central Province. Yeah. Tom Boyer did not become president. He was killed by Jomo Kenyatta instead. In 2002, just uh, fast forward, Raila Odinga was campaigning all over Central Province and was called Jamba. Kibaki was sick in England. When NAC formed the power. Where did Raila find himself? On the streets, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Now, so, so campaigning in central province means squat. It means zero. Zilch. It is meaningless. And by the way, Kenya is not just central province. I want people to understand that Kenya is not just Kikuyus. Yeah. Kikuyus are part of Kenya, but Kenya is not Kikuyu. Mm -hmm. Kenya is not Mount Kenya. And this uh, lack of self-esteem that Raila has vis-a-vis -vis the Kikuyu is a very big problem. He's desperate now saying that he's climbing Mount Kenya with a donkey. I don't know which donkey is it, whether it is Maina Kamanda or Murade or Uhuru, whatever donkey it is. It's not going to give him power. Raila thinks that the so-called deep state would give him power. Why didn't the deep state give him power in 2002? Why didn't the deep state give him power in 2013? Because he was prime minister at the time. He shared in the deep state. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. So how do you become president when the IBC is still controlled by the National Security Intelligence Service? How do you become president when the IBC servers are still in France and not open? How do you become president when you don't control the army and you, don't, and you have demobilized your people that organized for you to be sworn in in 2018? Do you see the stupidity? Nobody goes to negotiate without an army or without a, an organized base, without some kind of, of, of an ability to effect whatever gains you've made in that negotiation. Yeah. What does Raila have? So you see, the saying, Taliban were in the, in the mountains in Afghanistan. That's how they got power. Yeah. You understand? So and if you look at any other... He's, he's if you go to played. Zambia... Yeah. Let me just give that one example. If yeah. you go to Zambia... Yeah. Ichilema got power because he did not abandon his people. Mm -hmm. You understand? The people recognize him as a legitimate voice of resistance. And the state were constantly harassing and mistreating him as he was campaigning to get power. So the people gave him power. People are the ones who give, give power, not the deep state. Rhinodinga is in some lumberland. I don't know what it is called. And he will wake up too late to realize that he's in a border market and somebody else is in state house. 
Right, very clear, uh, Dr. Biguna. You said something very important that Kenya is not Mount Kenya. Kenya is not central province. And that brings me to this important question. We have seen um, uh, people like Moses Kuria, uh, they have come out to demand for positions, 40%. Um, uh, uh, they, they've called them their irreducible minimums. The deputy president position is non-negotiable for any person who's going to run for president. Uh, they have said they want 40% of all government appointments I mean, from where you sit, Dr. Miguna, I mean, wh how does this make so, you feel? Does it even make sense to you? <laughs> I don't normally re respond to people <laughs> who are meaningless. Uh, but to tell you the truth, so why don't they just go for 100%? I mean, why don't they, if they think that they control, the, if they have the numbers, and that their numbers determine who becomes president, mm -hmm. then let them just go and get it, right? 100%. Mm -hmm. Like, why, why, why 40%? Why do you want somebody else who, let's assume that the elections were free and fair and credible and somebody has actually won the elections? Now you are demanding, you have not contested, and you are coming with some myth that you are 40% uh, of the population, which you are not, and therefore you want 40% of the power. They will not get it. Uh, secondly, who are they negotiating with? Because I've not seen on the other side, who, who is it? that has this power that they want to give them uh, 40%. Mm -hmm. uh, and they're negotiating on behalf of whom? Because their constituency, if in fact, central province was supposed to be their constituency, mm -hmm. and I don't think it is, but let's assume for the sake of argument that it is. Mm -hmm. It's all with Ruto right now, really. Uh, we have to be honest. Mm -hmm. It's like 99% of it is with Ruto. So, so what are you negotiating? You are negotiating on behalf of what? Chicken or, or cattle in, in central province? These are jokers. And then the last point. Who are these? You see, Martha Karwa is the most ridiculous uh, uh, authoritarian uh, hypocrite in the Republic of Kenya. She helped Kibaki steal elections in 2007. And she told everybody to go sit on a pin. And now she's pretending to be representing something. She wants to be a governor of Kirinyaga. Let her go and contest in Kirinyaga and leave uh, these other issues. And then Moses Kuria, who the hell is he? He should tell us who killed Musando first before he can even stand to tell us anything else. Uh, you know, the less said about others, the better. You know, my friend uh, Kiunjuri should leave these guys alone. He's not committed the crimes these people have committed. Right. Um, so, Dr. Miguna, I would like to read some questions, some comments that have also come through before we wrap up this conversation. Um, on Facebook, I have Habarin Jema. That's what he calls himself. He says, Dr. M.M., one, what happens when court rulings or directives are ignored or disobeyed by the persons in office? A case example, your case. Question two, when you presented your documents before IBC and other agencies for clearance as a candidate in Nairobi gubernatorial election, did anyone complain of you being a Canadian? And then thirdly, any legal chances of coming back to Nyando? Uh, well, so let's take the, the first one uh, first. What happens when people uh, disobey court orders? Uh, number one, um, you go to court and you ask that they be found in contempt, which I did, and they were found in contempt. Um, unfortunately, my lawyers did not go for the enforcement of their orders. So my lawyers have failed me because they are too scared, I think. Mm -hmm. And so they have not enforced those orders. You can enforce those orders. Uh, and the, the, the judiciary, the way it is, will give you the enforcement instruments. Yeah. Uh, and then the chips will fall where they may. Mm. You will use those instruments politically to agitate or whatever, because ultimately they will not put each other in jail, but you have the orders. You can auction these people, for example, because Justice Mueta did a beautiful job. The orders were given against Matiangyadi's group personally. So these persons have properties in Kenya. We can auction their properties and get the monies that were awarded, which they have not paid a dime. Mm. 
So 7,270,000 was given because of the destruction and the infringement of my rights. Then 200,000 was again uh, awarded against them when they were convicted for contempt, none of which have been collected. All the costs of all the proceedings have not been collected. Those need to be collected. But somebody needs to go to court in Kenya physically to do so. Mm -hmm. Number two, the question is, did anybody ask me about, no, nobody did. I was cleared as a Kenyan, as it should have happened, and was allowed to run. That was not the first time. I mean, I, as you said, I tried to vie in 2007. There was no issue. I was the senior most advisor to the Prime Minister of the Republic of Kenya, which was a public office. I got paid by taxpayers' money. I traveled uh, on delegations to New York, to all over the world. And nobody stopped me and nobody said anything. And I represented ODM during the constitutional review process. Nobody said anything. So this thing they came up with is ridiculous. Mm -hmm. All right? Right. And uh, as to when they will see me in Yanda, I think I answered that question when we began. Right. So I'm not going to repeat a question I've answered. Right. Um, Oriop Simate says, Mr. Miguna Miguna, between Raila and Ruto, who do Kenyans deserve as president between the two, owing to the fact that they are both the front runners? This is not my question, Dr. Miguna, so it's not me. The no, I, I know it is not your question, and that is a question I've also answered. <laughs> right. Right. I've Another question, question here is, is yeah. according to his stand of revolution, ask him to clarify it, and as we are heading to 2022, whom did he support? I think he's trying to find out who you support uh, for 2022 currently. I, I support the people of Kenya. Uh, and I support the people of Kenya to rise up, uh, take matters in their own hands, take the country back from the oligarchs and transform it. That's what has to happen before Kenyans will enjoy the fruits of the resources, the resources that belong to them in the country. Kenya has oil, Kenya has precious metals, Kenya has good land. Kenya is a beautiful country, but it's all been turned into a slave plantation by five families. We must get it back. Right. Patrick Joy says this guy, Miguna, is breathing fire and comes back to ask. The Kenyan law is clear on regaining Kenyan citizenship. Let me guna follow the law and spare us the drama. Section one, section ten, one of the Kenyan Citizenship and Immigration Act 2011 provides a person who was a citizen of Kenya by birth and who ceased to be a citizen of Kenya because he or she acquired the citizenship of another country may apply in the prescribed manner to the cabinet secretary to regain Kenyan citizenship. What would you be telling this person? You see, there's nothing to tell him because those arguments were made in court and they were discredited by the judges. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you see, the unfortunate thing with these people is that they don't understand how law works. Mm -hmm. uh, when you have a case, you present it in court and you either win or lose. Yeah. So they have lost more than 30 times against me, all right? And I don't hold any public office. They have lost more than 30 times. They have made that argument more than 30 times in court, including at the Court of Appeal, and they have lost. Mm -hmm. So the judgment of Justice Mueta, Chacha Mueta of December 14th, 2018, stands. It's not been overturned. And it said, Miguna is a Kenyan citizen by birth. He never lost his citizenship. Period. Do you understand? Yeah. The passport was taken to him illegally and should be returned unconditionally. Miguna must be allowed to come to Kenya unconditionally. Justice Correa on the 6th of January 2020 said, Miguna is allowed to come to Kenya with his national ID card or the passport Matiangi and his group destroyed in his destroyed state. So, so I'm not going to argue these people had the opportunity to argue in court and they had a lot of lawyers and they had the state on their side and they have lost repeatedly. I'm very happy that I've won every time. And really, anybody who imagines that I can lose citizenship 
by doing nothing. You understand? Yeah. Uh, is dreaming. And let me educate the country because I think a lot of people are not also educated. When you flee out of your country because of genuine fear of persecution, or you are physically thrown out of your country, by law, you have not left because you did not leave voluntarily. By law. So your absence is absence in the terms of your physical absence, but it does not change your legal status in Kenya. Mm -hmm. So when you go back, it is like the clock is rewound back to the beginning, and it is like you never left. Okay? Yeah. Unless you do this, unless you renounce your citizenship. And remember, these people also are aware that I did not renounce Kenyan citizenship. And that if, if they say I did, let them prove that I did and they have no proof. Remember the case of, of uh, Mwende. Do you remember? Yeah. Mwende that Uhuru appointed ambassador even though parliament said she should not. Mwende was not born in Kenya. He was, she was born in the United States. She is a U.S. born citizen. Parliament told her to renounce her citizenship and she refused. Uhuru still appointed her, isn't it? Yeah. To a job that the law says only a citizen should have. But Mwende was right that you can't force her to renounce her citizenship, which mm -hmm. is U.S. Mm -hmm. On the other side, they are now claiming they renounced my citizenship for me. Mwende could not do it, but Meguna somehow did it through them. They renounced my own citizenship. And I say that kind of stupidity has no entertainment in my circles. Yeah. Finally, Dr. Miguna, the judiciary, <clears throat> while you are away, um, you know, we got a female chief justice. And there's been a lot of push and pull between the executive and the judiciary. Do you feel confident that probably the current constitution of the judiciary uh, would be able to fight this war in terms of ensuring that the country is on the right track uh, as far as court orders are concerned, even with your own case, uh, uh, you know, uh, what would you be saying about the current state of the judiciary in Kenya? Um, from I don't understand your question. You said the current constitution of the judiciary. What do you yeah, mean? Yeah, I'm, I'm saying uh, while you are away, the country did get a feeling. Not while I'm away. I think that you, you are now spoiling it. Okay, let me, let me not spoil it. Let me not spoil was it. was forced into exile. Yes, let me, let me, let me say it. While you were forced <laughs> into exile. <laughs> right, so while you were forced into exile, um, the judiciary got a female chief justice. I want, regardless of the gender of the chief justice or whatever it is, I want to read your thoughts. There's been a lot of supremacy battles. Some people have called it that, between the executive and the judiciary. Where do you see this, uh, uh, you know, for the sake of Kenyans um, who require someone to stand in the gap? Where do you see this going or taking us? Uh, I think the question is a bit muddy, but I'll try to answer it the best way I can. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Number one, there has not been any supremacy battle between the judiciary and the executive. Mm -hmm. The executive has disobeyed the constitution and has tried to illegally control the judiciary. Yeah. Uh, the problem has not been visited on the judiciary by the judiciary. The judiciary has not done anything. Uh, I think people are referring to Maraga. Maraga simply exercised his constitutional powers and authority and did not attempt to exercise powers that the constitution vests in the executive. Yeah. For example, Maraga did not purport to appoint civil servants. Maraga did not purport to sign executive orders. Maraga did not do anything other than what the constitution allowed him to do. But Uhuru, on the other hand, has tried more than a hundred times to control the judiciary. He refused to appoint judges, even though that the constitution does not give him power to decide who a judge, uh, who will be appointed a judge, when and how. 
Uhuru has refused to obey numerous court orders. Uhuru refused to uh, accede to the advisory that Maraga gave him with respect to the, uh, the third gender rule. Uhuru has disobeyed multiple court orders, not just on me, on so many other, you know, people, Kenyans, and institutions. Mm -hmm. So there is no um, uh, war, as it were, between the judiciary and the executive. Right. Uhuru's presidency declared a war on the judiciary once the Supreme Court nullified his electoral theft. He said he would revisit, and that's what he's been doing. Uh, so, for example, the BBI. Remember that on the 9th of March 2018, I said the BBI was illegal from the beginning. Mm -hmm. A lot of these people now running around, and some of them even went to court, supported the BBI, including David D. And I told them at that time, this thing is illegal. They, they condemn me all round. Yeah. They came around to my side, and I appreciate that. But this thing was illegal from day one. Uhuru tried to force it on Kenyans with Railodinga. This is a crime for which they have to pay. But the judiciary did well by declaring it null and void throughout. Mm -hmm. And I, I am 100% confident that if the Supreme Court conducts itself as a court, mm -hmm. this thing has no way um, of, of, of regaining life after its death. So I have to say, the only institution in Kenya that has tried to act in accordance with the Constitution and to protect public interest in Kenya is the Kenyan judiciary. Right. So that's the only institution that has tried. So for, for someone to come and say that there is something wrong the judiciary is doing is ridiculous. These are people who want lawlessness. The judiciary has acted diligently, conscientiously, and very ethically in drawing the boundary between institutions. You see, Railo Dinga and Uru Kenyatta have refused to accept that the constitution, Kenyan, constitution Kenyans gave themselves is a presidential system. Mm -hmm. It's a pure presidential system. You can't make it hybrid. You can't bring elements of parliamentary in it and purport to call it parliamentary when it is not. Right. Because then you're creating a mongrel. I wanted a parliamentary system if Kenyans remember this. I championed for it. That's part of the reason why Raila suspended me in 2011, because I disagreed with him. He betrayed Kenyans in 2011 the same way he's betraying Kenyans now. This man does not have a stand. Because in 2011, and uh, 2010, when we got the constitution, he wanted a presidential system. The constitution was not messed up in Naivasha. Right. It's a big lie. The constitution was messed up at Arambe House, and I was at that meeting. <clears throat> and Raila is the one who proposed uh, that amendment to the draft that came from the committee of experts, which was a hybrid. Mm -hmm. And Raila said... He wanted raw power so that he could bring equity to the country. That was his proposal. So now he says he wanted something else that, no, the people that went to Naivasha got instructions from their principals. Kibaki instructed his team PNU. Raila instructed his team ODM. They went to Naivasha and they got what the two principals told them to get. Mm -hmm. So it is a lie that Raila wanted a parliamentary system. Raila wanted a pure presidential system. That's what Kenyans voted for. He cannot run away from it. And he's not going to be able to create a mongrel so as to create an imperial presidency because of a promise from the deep state that they will steal elections for him. Kenyans must rise against this kind of despondency.
Right. So what you're saying is this whole BBI thing is dead and buried. The Supreme Court appeal, I don't know, going through Parliament, this is it's just a waste, waste of time. time. It's a waste of time, dead and buried. And in any case, you can't change the Constitution less than a year before elections. Yeah. So all this, in fact, these people are committing so many crimes, I don't know how long we will have to sentence them to jail. Because the amount of money they have wasted through lawyers that they are paying amounts that are unconscionable. You know, some of these people earn more than uh, five million a day. You know, people like Gidu Muigai, it's theft of, at a scale that has never been known. They have been earning insane figures, all right? Mm -hmm. uh, and yet you have state law office, you have uh, the attorney general, these people are paid not to go to court. And then they are paid to lose cases. Then they appeal frivolously to lose more because that is the only way they can steal. Mm -hmm. uh, the whole system is rotten through and through. Right. Dr. Miguel, to end it at this particular point, um, <laughs> I must accept uh, there's, there's, there's some comments here. The, the, the man with the same name twice has done it again. Miguna Miguna, the man of the era. And there's Davis Atundo says, Eti Anangwe Ameona Moto. Dr. I came prepared. Um, but if we were to count the scores, what would you be able to give? <laughs> it's done in good faith. Yeah. I don't give scores. Yeah. It's a good interview. And yeah. uh, let the chips fall where they may. As Thank I you very that. much for inviting me. And I appreciate it. Thank you so much, Dr. Ari. I hope we'll do this again next time. Yes, you gave me a platform, so I have to appreciate that, the fact that you did. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But as they say, it comes with the territory. Right. Asante. What I'm going to do after this, I'll definitely grab copies of the books, and I will read them, and then we'll have another conversation. Please do. And if you want to discuss them, discuss them from a point of knowledge. <laughs> Asante, Sarah, Dr. Ari. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Stay safe. All right, thank you very much. There you have it. Of course, uh, Dr. Miguna Miguna joining us live all the way in Canada. As we promised, we would be able to have that conversation. Thank you so much to the um, uh, many of you who've been uh, tweeting. Some of you have been able to send us your comments um, uh, through our online platforms. Um, Alan Omondi, you said that this is a question to Miguna. If you are a presidential aspirant, which ideology could you bring with you? Definitely the general has gone. Um, you've also said um, Raila disagreed with me because I wanted parliamentary system. These are some of the feedback or some of the comments um, uh, that uh, are coming through through our social media platforms. Remember, the conversation ends here on these four walls but continues across our digital platforms. The hashtag, as always, is the bottom line, KE. We are here every Monday from 9 p.m. to just try to make sense of the various political events in this beautiful country of ours. My name, as always, is Eugene Anangwe. Goodbye for now. value your feedback and welcome your complaints about our programming and operations. Feel free to get in touch with us through 0700-893-542 or send us an email to views at look-up.tv. We can't wait to hear from you.
grow your business, broadcast your sermon, share birthday wishes, make funeral announcements, produce adverts and documentaries, then book and advertise with us today by calling us on plus 254 7008935420. 7008935420. Email us on sales at luke-up.tv. The future of money is simple, like unlocking possibilities with a smile and having the world in the palm of your hand. It's the ability to touch many lives at the same time and turn your dreams into reality. It's forgetting and still remembering. Simple is having everything that you love in one place. From the ticket to your next meal, to your ticket to the next holiday, it's an easy way to ask for a boost when you're low. And keeping track of everything on the go. The future of money is simple, and it's here. Download the new Mpesa app today. Please make those payments and take them out the freezer. Enjoy your day off. Hey. How was your day? Great. Did you pay the bills? Abby did it. And the plumber? Abby did it. Send money to Abby your mom? Abby did it. Who's Abby? Bank on WhatsApp with Abby. Your 24-7 digital personal banker. Another digital innovation that gets things done. That's Africanacity. That's ABSA. Did you take dinner out the freezer? Whilst top icons and legends who have made history are dyslexic. Dyslexia is a learning disorder that is characterized by difficulty in reading due to problems with identifying speech sounds and learning how they relate to letters and words. Dyslexia affects areas of the brain that process language. Symptoms include delayed speech, learning new words slowly and a delay in reading. These legends made it and so can your child. Like, follow, subscribe, click the notification button. Join the Look Up TV movement now. Now. Now.